First of all, uh, I think Fred has departed, but I want to thank him and Microsoft, Michelle, uh, for hosting today. Uh, a great venue and a great turnout, and um, it's great to see everybody here in the room. And uh, all the folks that are watching uh, on live stream, um, I hope you've enjoyed so far. Uh, Congressman Kramer, uh, I mean, I think it's amazing to see the issues that the members of Congress are trying to confront. Um, and I really, uh, I sort of like to align myself about the drama and see if we can be a little more deliberate. Um, you know, um, what we have is a great panel here, and I, my job here is primarily to introduce them and then to keep things on track here. Um, but the panel is really going to talk about uh, the the business case for innovation, and particularly in the in the clean energy uh, low carbon arena. And uh, I think we're going to hear some some very interesting uh, some very interesting points from them. I have to say something very quickly about the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions (C2ES). You know, we're a nonpartisan uh, nonprofit, uh, but not non-functional uh, <laughs> uh, think tank. Um, and we really uh, aim to work on practical solutions and, and, and actually try to stay uh, in the no drama zone to try to really speak about uh, practical solutions to solving these very complicated problems and bringing people together to do that, particularly working with the business community. It's a pretty important uh, place to work with. It's probably one of the centroids of where innovation takes place in the United States, and you're going to hear some of that today from the panel. So we're I'm very, um, very happy to help uh, be the co-sponsor today and, and facilitate as we talk about innovative uh, climate action and low carbon solutions. So let me introduce the panel. Um, I want to make sure I get everybody's title correct. I know you all by name, but uh, Seth Roberts is the Global Director of Energy and Climate Change at the Dow Chemical Company. Michelle Patron. Patron is uh, the Director of Sustainability Policy at Microsoft. Sorry, Michelle. Uh, Peter Fuller is Vice President of Market and Regulatory Policy at NRG Energy. NRG, somebody exactly. figured that out, didn't they? Uh, and, and Paul Steffes is the President of uh, the Steffes Corporation, which I think the Congressman has already uh, I gave, gave a little bit of information on what you do, but we're looking forward to hearing about it a little bit more. So, uh, Seth, I'm going to start with you. Um, one of the things I think everybody will want to hear about here a little bit is uh, some of the items that your company is working on you know, right now that you see as a, a success in, in looking at uh, low-carbon innovation and, and how you see that fitting into the big picture. So why don't we start with you? Well, thanks, Bob. I'd also like to start out by thanking Microsoft, Fred and his team, Adrian for all the emails and getting us together, and to Michelle and Bob and your team for hosting this event. Uh, it's a very special topic to us at Dow. Um, I'm also struck by seeing how many young folks are in the audience here to come to hear about a topic like energy policy and climate policy. So we appreciate you because really you're the future of this. And we can talk more about that later, but I do see as I've gotten older, I see the younger generations having different views about sustainability, about you know, global warming, climate change, energy policy, all that type of stuff. And so things are changing, and you're part of that change. And so I certainly welcome you and your comments and your questions. At, at Dow, we use energy to do our chemistry worldwide. And, and putting it simply, we also use that chemistry to solve problems. And I can't think of a bigger problem to be working on than helping the world reduce its greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we, we, with more than, if you look around the room, more than 95% of what you see has some form of chemistry. Um, chemistry flows between the companies here on this panel, it flows around this room, the chairs you're sitting in. Uh, chemistry is an enabler. Um, we believe with that in mind that companies like ours and those on this panel and many that aren't even in the room will help solve this world challenge. And when I think of the pace of the change that's taking place, a lot of what Representative Kramer said, um, I was struck. I was at a meeting, a lot of what's in Washington is under Chatham House rules, so I won't talk about a meeting that didn't happen or who didn't say what. But under Chatham House rules, someone shared two slides, two pictures recently that really struck me. And the first picture they shared was a black and white picture, an old photograph of New York City, uh, the downtown area, circa about 1900, 1910. And what was in the photograph was um, a horse and buggies everywhere, up and down the streets. And there was this lone automobile tucked away in the lower right part of this picture. And then they showed the second picture, which was just a scant few years later, 
and it was all automobiles. And you couldn't find a horse uh, in the picture anywhere. The same part of town. Um, that's what we're dealing with here, are the potential of some of these things. And I've been in this space, I would say, energy, climate change, uh, you know, energy for Dow, working as an engineer, a business person, a policy person for about 26 years. And I can say as you start your careers, and I'm looking at young people, I've never been bored. Things are always changing. Uh, and I think that's something we can all look forward to and what drives that change. And we at Dow are leading uh, this change, particularly towards a sustainable energy future, uh, through what we call is the footprint, which is our own footprint, which is you know the smokestacks, all that stuff you see on television, what we do, uh, but and our processes. But there's also the handprint, uh, which is what we call our products. So if we take energy in, do our chemistry, we have products that go into insulation that make buildings more energy efficient. That are like film tech uh, reverse osmosis that does uh, uh, water purification throughout the world using 30% less energy than some of the historical technologies. We also have Betamate technology, which helps to adhesive, um, it's adhesive technology to make cars lighter, more gasoline efficient, more energy efficient, more electrical efficient, depending on how you want to play that. Um, then there's the blueprint, where we, we tie all this together. We have our corporate 2025 sustainability goals. I won't bore you with that. You can go out and look at our website about that. But, you know, uh, Dow cares. That's one of the reasons I went to work for Dow some 26 years ago, and I can still say that today, Dow cares. Um, and we're part of the, the solution. So I'm excited to be here and talk to you about this. One of the things, getting back to the question, we can talk about products, we can talk about the inputs and energy inputs. One of the things that illustrate the rate of change that comes to mind is in our footprint. Um, as part of leading the global business for, for Dow and looking at uh, procuring energy uh, in that role, um, we look to accelerate the development of cost-effective clean energy alternatives. That's one of our policy tenets. And about seven years ago, we started talking to people in the state of Texas. They were approaching us about doing some wind energy deals. And we said, look, that's really great. This would help us out a number of ways. We can see it could make good business sense, back to some of our topics. But you guys have got to compete. <clears throat> Natural gas is one of the benchmarks, particularly in this state. And so you, you've got to compete with your technology. And so it was about a five to seven year dialogue. But I can tell you about 18 months ago, we struck two deals to do about 350 megawatts worth of uh, wind energy in the state of Texas. So in the, where I would have least expected it, we are using wind to do our chemistry, wind energy to make chemicals in the state of Texas. Alongside using fossil energy, we can talk about all of that as well. But that's really a duality that I find just fascinating. And there's a whole number of policy issues we can talk about how that's happening, but um, it is happening. And it's happening at a rate, to give you an idea, megawatts, you know, as an engineer, I, I have some familiarity with it, but everybody doesn't think in megawatts, but 350 megawatts, to put that in perspective, that's about a third of a modern nuclear plant for the energy. Um, and that's the kind of, you know, things it takes to make a difference here. Um, also, Representative Kramer mentioned nuclear. I was in Paris working with the International Energy Agency. For those of you who know about them, we were also mentioning the word nuclear. So that's something somebody bring up. I won't get into that now. We can talk about nuclear later. But um, this is really happening. I think it's an exciting time to be in energy. I look forward to your questions and comments. And so pass it on to, to Michelle. Okay. Well, Michelle. We're just going to go down the road. Great. No sense in hopping. Absolutely. So as you've heard uh, throughout this morning, innovation is in our blood at, at Microsoft. And, and uh, let me explain some of the drivers behind what we are doing and then talk about a, a few instances of, of, of clean innovation. So there's three really important drivers for us. Like Dow, our resource consumption is going up. Right? As we build out a cloud, we are building more data centers around the, around the country and around the world. We're using a lot more energy, we're using a lot more water, we're using a lot more land, we're using, we're creating waste, and, and we see this as a responsibility and opportunity. It's also a cost for us, so we're trying to make sure how we can minimize the cost and, and minimize uh, our impact on the environment. So we've set some ambitious corporate goals there, uh, primarily right now around carbon, around energy. On our energy goals, we have um, set a goal to get 50% of our, our data center energy from solar, wind, and hydro by the end of, uh, of, of next year. 60% by the early 2020s, and to keep going from there. And to put it in perspective for you, we currently use about as much energy as a small state, a small U.S. state, and that's the same as, as other technology companies, other large technology companies. Uh, and in the next few decades, you know, that could be the size of a medium-sized economy. So this is a huge task. 
Uh, we take it really seriously. We're very excited about it. And that is helping drive innovation both internally and externally, which I I'll get back to. The second driver for us is, is our customers. Our customers are very interested in helping us develop solutions for them that help them uh, operate more efficiently, reduce the resources, uh, in some cases reducing their carbon footprint as well. You know, we have customers around the country, around the world, private sector, public sector, schools, universities, companies, in the utility space, in the financial industry space, in the ag space, and all of them are looking for, to us to, to help them uh, address some of these challenges. And so that's also uh, helping drive what we're doing in this space. And the third is technology. <laughs> Over the last few years, we've seen tremendous advances in cloud-based technologies, in deep learning and advanced analytics that allow us to process massive amounts of information and make sense of it. Make sense of it so that we operate our buildings and our factories and our supply chains more efficiently so that we can operate our grids and balance the grid more efficiently and allow us to, to put on more, more renewables onto the grid and allow the, to us to, to support more um, electric vehicles as a country and, and, and as a globe um, that allow uh, agricultural um, entities to, to increase their yields and reduce their resources. So there's a lot of potential here and we're really excited about that. Talk about two specific pieces of examples of innovation. One has to do with building efficiency. Uh, we have a, a, li a large um, presence and a large campus in, in Redmond. It's uh, 125 buildings over 88 acres. Some people consider it a small town. Uh, but we put this technology to work for, for our campus. And uh, we were able, to, through employing a lot of this uh, sensors to collect the information and process the information and help us understand how we could better use our air conditioning, how we could better maximize space throughout not just one building, but buildings across the campus, we're able to reduce our energy consumption by 15% at our campus, which resulted, in, along with some other factors, in a reduction of $10 million a year in our energy bill. Uh, and that it was such a, uh, an important development and, and, and um, innovation that then we began to sell it to, to a bunch of customers. And so it sold it to custom customers um, who, who began to do this uh, across the United States and, and around the world. And, and um, one such instance is, uh, is a, a few colleges who have done had similar experiences and, um, and, and uh, we did this across some buildings in Singapore as well. Uh, the second innovation I want to talk about is, is actually on the policy. And I think it's appropriate given the conversations that we have, that we just heard from um, Representative Kramer. And so as we are looking to procure more renewable energy, one of the challenges we face is, is the regulatory structure. And so we just uh, got approval for a very, very unique contract in Washington State. Uh, it was an agreement, a contract between our Puget Sound Energy, who's our utility, local utility there, and Microsoft that allows Microsoft to go to the open market for a direct access for its energy consumption. Uh, as part of that, we are paying a, a, a transition fee, a $24 million transition fee to Puget Sound Energy. Uh, we are also committing in our contract to be 100% carbon free in the energy that we buy, including renewables in Washington State, which are a very narrow definition, uh, which are well in excess of what's required of, of the state by the state RPS. We're continuing to pay into the local programs uh, both the low-income program as well as the conservation program. We're actually upping what we're paying in the low-income program because we want to make sure that this deal benefits all of the rate payers and, uh, and that keeps everyone whole. And we did this in, in pretty close collaboration with Puget Sound Energy. We'll continue to be a customer for them for transmission and for distribution and other services, uh, but so much so that we put out a joint press release with them. So we're really excited about the kinds of innovations that we can have with our customers, that we can have on our own campus and our own footprint, but also how we can help um, move the needle forward on, uh, on some of these uh, tough regulatory challenges. Thanks. Thank Great. You. Maya? Okay. Um, well, good morning. And uh, again, I want to extend my thanks to uh, the C2ES team, the Microsoft team. Thank you all very much. Thank you all for coming out. I hope, uh, hope we have something interesting to offer to you today. Um, so I work for NRG Energy, and to, to make the North Dakota connection, um, NRG uh, originally came out of Excel, or the, the, the predecessor of Excel, uh, Northern States Power, one of the predecessors. And there are two apocryphal stories you can choose, that NRG is either a contraction of the word energy, or it's the non-regulated group. Take your pick, but anyway, it all ties back to, uh, to Minnesota and North Dakota, uh, ultimately. We're currently uh, headquartered in uh, Princeton and Houston, 
And we are, uh, I think at the moment, I think it's safe to say the largest, if, or certainly one of the largest, uh, what we call independent power or, or integrated, uh, non-regulated uh, power companies, energy companies in the country. And we think we've taken a leader, leadership position and, and plan to continue uh, in that position, uh, both in terms of, of the technology issues that we're talking about, uh, the regulatory issues, the policy issues, uh, sustainability overall. Um, I think unique in the space, we have a uh, broad-based corporate sustainability initiative internally. So right up the chain, the governance, the transparency, the supply chain, all of the things that normally go along with sustainability. And we, much like Microsoft and Michelle was just talking about, are, are very uh, interested in um, projecting that and using that same kind of ethos and mindset and, and sense of innovation to provide solutions to our customers and, and also along the sustainability uh, line of things. So the, one of the big um, headlines on that is our commitment as a company to reduce our absolute CO2 emissions uh, by 50% by 2030 and 90% by 2050. Um, last report I saw was as of 2016, we're already 36% on the way. So, you know, making good progress there. A um, uh, couple of folks, uh, Congressman Kramer and, and Bob mentioned drama. For those of you who are following the financial pages, you know, we do have a little bit of drama going on with our transformation. Uh, what I think of as financial repositioning of the company. Um, but what I am quite confident of in talking with the leadership team is that the, uh, the carbon commitment maintains. We just need to recalculate and figure out how we now track it with a, a different portfolio. The sustainability uh, initiative and, and part of the company maintains. And uh, sort of to, to get to the innovation side and, and what we are doing here, uh, our external facing focus uh, with our customers like Dow, like Microsoft, like the other big corporates and, and all the way down the, the small CNI customers, that remains the same. And our offerings are, are going to be substantially similar in terms of renewable energy, um, services with regard to um, uh, demand response, efficiency, other things that we can do to help customers uh, get better results with their, their energy dollar, um, di distributed resources, and uh, thermal energy. So that package of, of offerings and our approach to customers is still going to be uh, the same. Um, I think the, um, as we think about the energy space overall, um, we really see the world heading to uh, what we think of as the four product future. And this is where I might, you know, uh, maybe put on the, uh, the, the pin board something to, to take up about what the Congressman said about baseload resources. We think the future is really about four products, renewable energy, solar and wind. Those are energy workhorses. They put out a lot of energy. It's free. Every kilowatt hour is virtually costless the next kilowatt hour once you've made the investment. That's where we should be getting our energy from. Then you need a lot of storage. You need a lot of this technology that will help um, demands, you know, loads, lights, air conditioners, what have you, refrigerators, water heaters. Uh, you'll need a lot of technology to, to integrate that and manage the, the timing of when the, the energy is available, how the batteries are using and when people are using the energy. And ultimately, we probably need a little bit of um, fossil or, or some kind of dispatchable energy that really is available all the time because, as a congressman noted, um, reliability is, is not really negotiable here. That, that's got to be maintained. So we do see a role for some fossil going forward, probably gas. But um, we ultimately think that the, the, the system will define itself if we get to where the congressman is talking about, about being fuel neutral with our policies and our uh, ability for customers to choose. It will become fuel neutral. And the concept of baseload, which is the most economic thing today that runs all the time, will, will and, and is shifting to be more renewables now, to be hydro, to be um, the, the storage that's going to be cycling on a regular basis. Um, so a couple of things I wanted to talk about and highlight, um, I already kind of hit on and I don't have any particular uh, specific elements to point out, but uh, we are doing a, you know, I think a very um, widespread and uh, we feel very successful business with corporate customers uh, like the folks here and others uh, to provide them that range of services. And we think in doing that, 
Uh, again, it pushes our, our views on sustainability and takes the expertise that we've gained from managing our own facilities and, and working in the wholesale markets as well as some of the uh, vertically integrated regulated state markets um, and, and provides uh, real innovation and really, you know, boots on the ground, dirty fingernails kind of helps people manage their energy and, and lower their footprint. The other one that um, is a great headline for us and uh, um, pending, you know, the, the right economics and the right environment, uh, we hope to uh, be able to do more with is our Petronova um, carbon capture and sequestration project. Um, and I think, again, as a little side light, we can put a pin in this one. Um, to the paper that um, Congressman Kramer mentioned that Tony Clark wrote, I, I commend it to all of you to read because I think Tony's got a very clear uh, and, and crisp voice on this and really lays out some of the issues. I think what, what one of the things that we think is Petronova stands for the, the, uh, the prospect that it is not, we should not be agnostic about the choice that Tony lays out in his paper between full bore regulation and uh, competitive choice and um, you know, investor risk. We feel that um, we were able to deliver that project based on pure commercial terms, pure commercial economics, on time, on budget. It's operating successfully in Texas, taking some five, uh, I think it's five million tons a day, 5,000 tons a day, I'm, don't quote me on the number, but a lot of carbon uh, emissions out of the air and um, we, we did that, again, without any government directive, without any um, uh, regulatory oversight. So we think that that is a great example, along with a lot of the things that we're seeing investment-wise in the eastern RTO markets in Texas and California, uh, as really standing for the proposition that, um, as Michelle uh, and, and Microsoft found in Washington, customer choice, customer access to options is is really the, the smart way to go. So um, again, we are committed to, to continuing that sustainability effort, and uh, I think at that point I'll, I'll pass it on to Paul and uh, look forward to questions. Okay, we'll hey, take it away, Paul. Okay, so <clears throat> thank you. I'd like to say good morning, and uh, thank you, Bob, and uh, thank you for Microsoft for inviting me to come to this. For background, uh, Stuff is, is a North Dakota-based manufacturing company. We employ about 400 people. And uh, we manufacture a whole variety of products from uh, buckets for bobcats to uh, uh, a whole variety of, you know, things for the oil and gas production industry. But for the last three decades, we've been very active in, uh, in energy storage. And uh, these are devices that, uh, you know, basically use off-peak electricity and, uh, you know, because it's a lot more less expensive than uh, on-peak electricity. We, we have a flagship product line that uh, we sell to 200 electric utilities around the U.S. and Canada. And uh, you know, just to kind of give you a sense for a, what an energy storage product is, here you can see uh, you know, a standard water heater. This, this is what is in every home in America, basically. And you can think of a water heater as a 10 to 25 kilowatt hour battery when properly controlled. And, uh, and then we also have a line of you know, ceramic storage devices that will store from 15 to 500 kilowatt hours of energy. And these are very interesting batteries in that you charge them just like any other battery. The discharge of them is the delivery of hot water to the home or space heat to the home or business. And we have about 100,000 of these things installed you know, over the last you know, three decades. In the 90s, uh, you know, controlling these devices were very simple. Off-peak electricity was less expensive, and you simply needed to have a utility load controller that would say, don't charge right now, or a time clock to charge at certain hours. But, uh, you know, certainly things have become, you know, more complicated. But in the early days, it was a very simple, a you know, very simple control concept. You had controls, and you had energy storage. But if you fast forward today, you know, you know, in fact, to this exact moment, you know, these two concepts are more important than ever. Controls, you know, not the simple time clock or a single on-off utility load switch, but microprocessor-based micro controls. And with the advent of uh, you know, Microsoft Azure Cloud, 
you know, where we have the ability, you know, to big, you know, to process big data in real time, you know, we, we certainly can bring a whole new dimension to this where we can provide fast and predictable up and down regulation, integrate much higher percentage of renewable energy, you know, you know and, and reduce greenhouse gases and do, you know, wonderful things. Along with, it's interesting that, uh, you know, we have Dow Chemical here that is, you know, providing lots of the things and lots of the innovations that energy is, uh, innovations and projects that energy is doing and leading the way and, uh, you know, introducing lots of, you know, more uh, renewable energy. So, uh, you know, th this is something, uh, you know, beneficial electrification, you know, we define it as something that saves the consumer money, reduces greenhouse gases, and benefits the grid. And what this technology allows us to sell a lot more KWH, green KWHs, sell a lot more of those zero carbon KWHs that are being curtailed in an increasing percentage as we as we go to a higher percentage of renewable. Uh, one thing I'd like to talk about is um, you know today you know this technology one one specific project in uh, is in Hawaii, and uh, you know we all know how solar energy varies from second to second during the day. Clouds come over. There's a number of reasons that uh, it is not overly, uh, overly, you know, dependable in this, you know, completely dispatchable on a second to second basis. Here is, uh, you know, 499 water heaters, you know, recently installed in one large apartment complex. And that what our project does, it allows individual homes and utilities to change the charge rate from second to second to better utilize, you know, the abundance of renewable energy that's there. You know, just to, to give you one example, you know, th these 500 units, you know, this is from uh, 6 in the morning to 6 in the evening. Collectively, they charge at a rate that really mirrors the real-time output of the sun. And in the middle of the night, the system with the Microsoft telemetry to it is, is sitting there, and if there is a high-usage water heater that particular day, We'll give them a little bit of energy just to get them to, you know, through until you know, morning. But you can see how we can drive the percentage of, of energy up in these devices very, very high, and uh, you know, basically you know, driving them to near 100% renewable. And so this is a, a technology that uh, uh, you don't really think of in terms of a, a, a very efficient means of storing energy. But thermal energy is an extremely efficient way of storing energy, assuming that you have a need for thermal energy where the where the devices you know are physically at. You know that that makes them you know very very efficient. So um, you know with this you know finally there is there's a lot of new exciting products you know on the market, but the excitement of Gets this grid interactive electric thermal storage device that we've uh, you know, put together, it, you know, is that it uses that common water heater. It is found in virtually every home. In addition, a study at Sandia National Lab in 2012 identified that thermal storage, hands down, was the least expensive way of storing energy, you know, bar none. The integration of smart controls and water heaters is a common sense addition to the stable of products that will be required to manage the grid of the future efficiently and in turn reducing carbon emission. Well, so um, let me just say something quick and, and throw another question to you guys and then we'll, uh, pop, we'll try to get some questions from the audience and folks who are um, uh, live watching on live stream. So what I think we just heard here is, is pretty remarkable and what, what dawned on me while I was listening, especially to Paul, at the end is is how uh, how many different business sectors have to and and have to coordinate and and be involved with some of the solutions that we're looking at. You know, traditionally when I started as, as a minister working on air pollution and water pollution, I would try to find the sources of the pollution and say, what can we go do with that source of pollution to control it? And certainly that is not outside the realm of what we think about these days. But what we think about more, and what American business is thinking about more, is how do they do things differently so the pollution isn't created in the first place? This is a, is a whole new different way. It's not brand new. We've been doing pollution prevention for a long time. But what this is, is systemic ec uh, economy-based uh, thinking about how you change the way things happen. And 
how different uh, business sectors rely on each other. Just in Paul's product alone, you mentioned chemistry, you mentioned uh, technology, and you have to have a, a utility partner that's got wires and other things that are connected to the system. Not so much maybe in Hawaii, it's a little smaller scale there, but, um, but you know, I've been on uh, wind generators on the north shore of Oahu, so I, I know that there's a little bit of diversity going on up there. And interestingly enough, uh, Pete, when I was at a conference over the weekend and, and we were going on about this issue that the congressman was talking about, base load, which is obviously a, a, a warm issue in the, in, in the Capitol for a variety of different uh, it, reasons. But somebody in your power sector, mm -hmm. also Chatham House here, but um, somebody in your sector mentioned the fact that there's somebody in their company working on a concept called a virtual um, base load a virtual baseload plant using technology to be able to isolate the, the, the part of the grid that is defined as baseload this, today. Sure. It could get sure. down to this minute. So it is really, I mean, that's not here now, but uh, when you start thinking about the complexity of the grid and what's happening and the intelligence that may be in the future, that concept, at least people are starting to talk about a virtual uh, baseload plant. And it's, uh, it's kind of an interesting world that we're going into. So one of the questions to all of you, given all these interrelations, including amongst just the, the, you guys here on the, on the panel, um, what do you, a simple question really, what, what, <laughs> what do you see as some of the barriers to make some of this go faster uh, or that need to be dealt with to make this go faster and what, what might be some solutions? of policy and, and other things. That's like a big macro question, but taking it from the next step from your experiences uh, as you innovate, um, what what's in the way of more and, and what could make it go faster? And we'll just go down the line here. <clears throat> I think there's two things, Bob, that come to mind, and I think they've been mentioned by others in the room and on the panel, is there's energy intermittency and there's density, particularly as we talk about wind or solar. But I think that the next of, the, of that could be uh, battery storage, which has been mentioned, a lot of either virtual or real storage. Um, and particularly as we've interfaced a lot with the grid, we move power, uh, we produce our own power. Uh, like the, the technologies that we've talked about with wind, as you introduce wind into the grid, as many of you know, you know, the wind blows certain periods of the day, but then in off peak, you know, what do you do? And so sometimes the wind blows during peak, uh, but how do you balance that out? And so storage is certainly being being looked at uh, there as well. <clears throat> I'll also tell you a story um, that um, is interesting to me. We uh, subscribe and been partners with MIT, their global change program, for a number of years. People often have told me there's a joke, and I, I'm not going to go on either side of this, but if you want words, you go to Harvard. If you want numbers, you go to MIT. So we needed some words, we needed some numbers, but we went and talked with MIT. This has been many years ago, and they've had a global model, uh, <clears throat> which I think is unique to model all factors of global change, and they're looking at it versus against a two degrees Celsius move or 1.5 degrees or a four degree trajectory, pick your number, but they can model this and world population and our demand supply growth, all this type of stuff that's going on, sea surface temperatures, all this complex modeling, and I said, look, if I believe your case on two degrees Celsius, how are we going to get there? And they talked about renewables and energy intermittency and density, and they gave a one-word answer of how we could get there with everything we know today. And I certainly think, I didn't go to MIT, but there's certainly a lot of smart people that do. Um, I asked, I said, what's the one-word solution to this? With everything you know, every technology you know. Anybody in the room want to guess what the one-word answer was? Magic. Storage. I haven't heard it yet. Sorry. No. I haven't heard it yet. <laughs> yes. I'm not getting into that one way or the other. I'm just telling you, and that same word was uttered at the International Energy Agency in Paris with a, a diverse group of folks under Chatham House rules. Um, but <clears throat> I'm just challenging our thinking. It hasn't been mentioned here today. Nuclear. Nuclear. And I understand that there's a twofold factor because I'll tell you another story there. Um, in 2006, 2007 time frame, when we, like many others in our, our country, as a, as a global multinational, but also as an American-based company, and traditionally American company, we were convinced the, the country was running out of natural gas. 
And as for gas prices were high and volatile, and we were looking, where would we get the energy to do our chemistry? And we were pretty far down the line looking at what I would say are a very different technology uh, than what's happened in Fukushima or what happened in uh, Three Mile Island here many years ago. All this, is, there is new technology uh, that is inherently safe, uh, but there's two fold, I think, challenges. We talked about barriers to that technology. There's the public fear, which is absolutely justified. There is a financial fear uh, of trying to get through the permitting processes to even uh, implement some of that technology. And I will tell you what's really happening. We in our country, with Sandia, we mentioned the labs, I've been to Idaho National Labs and toured a lot of this technology is being developed in our own national labs, but it's going to countries like China uh, in the future of technology. We aren't adopting it here, but if you look at the Chinese, I was in Beijing about three or four months ago, and overwhelmed by the city of Beijing. There's 22 million people there, plus the almost billion plus in China, they're looking to do more of what I would say is westernization and getting jobs moving to the city, so they have a thirst for energy. And the Chinese are, have a diverse set of energy policies where they're doing some renewables traditionally like we think. They're doing wind, solar to big scale, but they're also including nuclear, natural gas, coal, all of the above, which someone else mentioned about it. There's certainly a lot of power, pardon the phrase, in having diversified energy policy. Um, but I do leave you with some thoughts about nuclear. Um, so there's a bridge between, uh, to give you some idea of one of the, these, these, the wind technology, um, there's a hundred wind turbines, about two megawatts apiece, they're GE machines in South Texas on a mesa that some very smart folks from California found just the right conditions to do just the right stuff that we needed. Um, but it took 40,000 acres. Michelle. So we focus a lot uh, on, on the energy sector, and I think it's important like to, to lift up and, and realize just in the last few years what has changed, right? You have this two-way flow now of energy, not just going from some central um, facility or central organization out to customers, but going both ways. You have very new technolo technological advances behind the meters, if they're solar panel, electric vehicles, storage, demand-side management, that really provides you a lot more kilowatts without having to, to build a, a new plant. You have the potential now, as, as Paul alluded to, of this dynamic pricing and also dynamic distribution and 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 um, and, and, and just based on what where, where demand is, where supply is, what the price is, what the carbon content is, that you can really bring to to um, to bear in these markets. And and so a lot of this technology is is accelerating so much faster than policy. And so I think all of the things we talked about today is market design. It's a really complicated discussion. There's lots uh, of vested interest there, and, and there's lots of, of different uh, hypotheses and, and philosophies, but I think that's where we're, what, what really can, getting the market design right can really unleash a lot more of this innovation. Um, speaking more broadly on a lot of the cloud-based technologies that we talked about, I mean, for us, it's, it's adoption of the cloud and getting people familiar with what the cloud is, is capable of doing. And, and how that can and be brought to bear for, for their businesses and, and, and access to, you know, the, the data that um, in, in a very safe way that, and, and for respecting all the privacy that, that can, can allow you to, to, to understand what is happening and to be able to, to, um, to optimize of, of what is the potential of data. Last week, we announced that Microsoft a new program called AI for Earth which was basically is a new program to put some of these tools in the hands of organizations, individuals that are on the front lines of, of facing, uh, addressing some of the toughest environmental challenges. Providing tech grants available, we're providing digital skills available, uh, digital skills training. We also want to drive innovation here. So we uh, presented three Lighthouse projects. Let me go through one of them just to understand the, the potential here. We did a project in the Chesapeake where it basically took government data that was publicly available but was seven years old and was not necessarily um, uh, actionable. It was uh, at a very, very low resolution. And working with a partner, Chesapeake Conservancy, and other, uh, and other organizations, we helped make that um, data 900 times more powerful so that you were able to get the resolution down to one meter and really do precision conservation about what's happening in the watershed, where you should be developing, where you should be prioritizing your conservation. How can you know, fishermen in, in, uh, improve their, their, their um, their takes and do it more sustainably? How can uh, farmers improve their yields and do it more sustainably? So there are so many applications that, of these technologies that help on the business side, but also help on the conservation side.
So at, at the risk of maybe you know, repeating some of Michelle's themes, I want to start actually not with a barrier, but with the enabler. And I think, you know, the technology that has moved so fast that we all carry in our pockets, that the communications, the, the ability to manage huge amounts of data um, in very short times, in real time, um, changes the game completely because you no longer have to worry about, uh, it, I, I think density is an issue, but it's not the same issue that it was five or 10 years ago where you needed to have one power plant and you could see that and understand it and, and work with it. Now, if you have 100,000 homes with a, a water heater or something, that can be done today where it couldn't have been done a few years ago. So that technology, along with better solar panels, better wind turbines, uh, all of that stuff, better battery chemistries, new battery chemistries, new battery approaches, all of that stuff is a technology enabler that I think is we need to, to take into account here. I think the barriers, um, probably not surprisingly, uh, again, to pick up on Michelle's themes, are um, regulatory, regulatory and policy that are maybe still thinking about the days when it was centralized power, one-way flow, uh, rate payers instead of consumers, thinking about people with choice. Um, you know, I, I think we, the, the, the state regulators and federal regulators that I work with all the time are great people uh, who are really trying to do a good job, but I think they have a tremendous challenge in bringing that, that whole paradigm that they work with into the 21st century and trying to get ahead and, and understand how to best leverage uh, the technology that's out there. And the other one is the one that, that's always in the way of everything. It's money. It's the, the economics of all of this stuff. And that loops back a little bit to policy, right? Somebody asked about uh, subsidies and different subsidies and who gets paid for what and where the government support is and so forth. Um, I mean, if you look around today, um, and, and these are right in the headlines just this week, you know, we have a lot of trouble with the, uh, the, the, the government targeted support for the nuclear units in New York and Illinois, for example. Not because we don't like nuclear, but because they're targeted, individualized uh, choices that the government's making that don't really recognize, you know, the carbon attribute or the jobs attribute or whatever. They're just picking particular plants. We think that's a real problem. And so bringing back to the regulatory sphere, the regulatory and policy space to get better thinking about what are the attributes we, we really want? What are the things that we need to value so that we get the kinds of resources, the kinds of technologies, the kinds of options that we want? How do we build that structure going in? And then you can unleash the, the private capital, which we think is the way to do it, to produce those innovations, give customers choices, Customers will make those decisions, and you won't have to worry, if you do it right, you won't have to worry about the government uh, being some kind of a safety net for those 30 or 40 year assets because the customers have done it. Or I've made an investment based on a tariff and my expectation there of a market price, not based on a, a 30 or 40 year uh, cost recovery commitment from the government. So we think it's, you know, technology is the game changer. Now it's up to the regulatory sphere to, to understand how to use that and, um, and, and work with the economics so that we get the right answers. Oh, I'll just talk briefly. You know, the one thing that is a barrier is that the way that electricity is sold is typically on a flat rate for residential customers. You know, they, it doesn't matter when they buy it. It can be, you know, really, you know uh, really a congested time or a non-congested time. The utility might even be having a negative price situation where they're going to be paid to consume electricity. So uh, in my mind, we need some vehicle to get signals to homes, whether it's a price signal that varies in real time, or what in my mind is, you know, simpler is to have the utility, you know, take the complexity on their shoulder, and they know that they're either paying an extremely high price for electricity, or they're getting you paid to take it. They, they're aware of this, and we let the utility do behind the meter types of aggregation or you know types of control to uh, take to take best advantage of this, and then to to socialize those benefits to specific people participating in those programs. And it has the effect of basically lowering the electric rates for all consumers, though. So it is a interesting type of direction to be pushing. The other thing I just wanted to say, you know, certainly nuclear is a, a wonderful piece. You know, just hearing from you that you own NXP, you know, and if, go back to 1972. I'm a 
I'm a construction engineer in the Prairie Island Edison nuclear plant. There you go. Plant. There so you go. We, we all have some <laughs> nuclear experience in another lifetime. But but anyway, nuclear is a must-run asset, and so they need storage just like anyone else, and more so because they've got to run. You know, just like renewables, which is a must-take resource. They need to have energy storage to suck it up whenever it's there. So, so they both need, even if we go down the nuclear path, you're still going to need lots of uh, cost-effective, uh, you know, flexible resources, energy storage. Well, thank you, guys. Um, very good discussion on uh, re reinforcing the inter interrelationships of the different uh, sectors here. I want to try to get some questions from the audience now. I know. A little late, but we got a little flexibility here. I think uh, you had your hand up first. Do we have oh, microphones? Microphone. Oh, oh, here it comes. <laughs> Over here. Oh, oh. Your second. I uh, <coughs> read Dutchman with the UN Foundation. Uh, you've talked a little bit about um, disruptive technologies, uh, distributed uh, energy systems, uh, the various uh, innovations that are occurring. Michelle, could you say a little bit about how Microsoft is pursuing this as a business opportunity to transform the energy system, not just uh, the uh, more uh, CSR kind of activities? Exactly. Um, uh, you know, for us, as I think uh, Paul alluded to, I mean, we, we sell solutions, technology solutions to our, our customers, and a lot of our customers are, are utilities, and a lot of our customers are, um, are active in the energy space. So to the extent that you know, cloud uh, enabled solutions. Um, our SaaS can help be uh, a, 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 um, can can help them in their goals and can help them um, on the energy side if it's through balancing the grid. We did a, a project in, in Norway, for example, uh, with Ogder Energy, and on that we basically you know deployed our cloud and uh, and our predictive analytics and to understand where the weather patterns were and what the demand patterns were and what assets were available to deploy on the other side. Were there some additional solar panels? Were there some additional demand side management? Were there electric vehicles that could be plugged in? And to help Ogder balance the grid in the first phase of the project. And in doing so, you know, obviously we've done a Microsoft software, um, but they also uh, benefited as, as a company themselves. They avoided the need to build an additional substation. Uh, they, were, you know, they were able to integrate more renewables onto the grid and to, to power more electric vehicles. So this is actually, it's, it's really not at all our, our CSR. It's about fundamentally how our solutions and how our technologies can help our customers achieve those types of goals, both in the electricity sector and beyond. All right, the next question was right here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Damon Walia, uh, president of Arctech Inc. Uh, I didn't have the benefit of, uh, I missed out some of it uh, with the Washington traffic. Uh, mm -hmm. But anyway, question. yeah, question is, a, see, this whole energy innovation really was triggered by the first oil embargo of 1973. And since then, huge amount of innovation has continued, and I've been part of that for about 40 years. The conundrum in this whole scenario is that it's not the nuclear. The one word is OPEC. And I'll explain to you, because we're dealing here not with a level playing field in the energy sector. It costs only 50 cents or $2 a barrel to produce oil. So by keeping these oil prices up and down, the production that if, and so a lot of innovation simply has not been succeed in not only from the economics point of view, whether it's a nuclear, solar, or any of those things. Coal is one of those that's where I have focused on. So we need a policy which will then create a level playing field. And so I'll be happy to share with any one of you what I have done. I've been I've failed about six times, but I think <laughs> I have a solution which can overcome that issue. Right. Thank you very okay. much. All right. You had a question here. Questions, though, please. Hi, this is directed at Michelle, but anyone can answer. So MGM Resorts in Nevada recently did what you guys and Microsoft did in Washington State in terms of working with their state to alter procurement and go to the direct market, becoming the first company in Nevada to do so. Do you think this is a burgeoning trend in the private sector? Um, and how would you think it is? How do we support that? Can you just let me know who you're from? Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm an intern with ACOR. Okay, great. So we're, we're really excited about it. I think as you've heard before, and I think a lot of other folks up here can speak to this as well, because this is, this is a, you know, an important issue about um, customers having more choice about their um, energy sector. Look, every customer has.
have to determine what's important for them and what works for them based on their own needs, based on their own capabilities, and based on the regulatory structure in which they operate. The, the, the driver for us was that we wanted to go faster to procure renewables and to procure 100% carbon for our campus. And the way that we thought that we could go faster was reaching into an agreement with our utility to be able to go go at, you know, out to the open market and, and procure ourselves. There are some differences and some lessons learned that we saw from the Nevada case that we're able to build into what we did, which was that, um, you know, we are not, we're just, it's just about our generation. We're going to continue to be uh, a customer of PSC when it comes to our transmission and our distribution services. We also wanted to make sure that the local ratepayers uh, were protected. Uh, we are, you know, we are uh, a Washington State company. We take that, and we are part of the Washington State community. We take that responsibility very, very seriously. And so, what we did was we made sure that it was in the public interest by paying a hefty fee, a hefty transition fee that will be refunded to ratepayers. Then we wanted to make sure that we were continuing to pay into the local programs. Uh, and so that's why we continue to do the, the conservation program. And we actually increased by 150% what we are doing into the low income programs. Uh, and then we also wanted to be very clear about our intentions, which was this was about accelerating the deployment of renewable and clean energy. And that's why we committed in a binding contract to commit to purchase 100% carbon, including renewable energy under the RPS of the state, which goes up to 40%. If you look at what the, the state requires, I think by 2020, it's 15%. So we are in way excess of doubling what the utility is required to do under the RPS. And so I think those were, um, you know, new innovations. And, and the major innovation was the cooperation that we had with the utility on this. This has been a tense issue, and it continues to be a tense issue. Mm -hmm. And we're hoping by having address the tough issues by getting together and figuring out, okay, what, what do we all really need to feel comfortable about this? We can help you know, stop on the ground for these kinds of conversations where it makes sense for other customers and other utilities. Right, um, right here. Is there a way to get uh, questions from uh, folks that are streaming? I thought there might be, but if there isn't, I won't stop saying that. Okay, okay. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke all of you watching online. <laughs> You'll have to and I misadvised. <laughs> you'll have to hope somebody here asks your question. <laughs> uh, hello, my name is James Green. I'm a student at the University of Virginia. Um, yesterday I was attending a Senate hearing on national security and energy. And one of the issues discussed was how many of the minerals used in clean um, energy technologies are sourced from um, countries abroad and often in conflict areas. So my question is, do any of you all see this sourcing of minerals that are necessary for clean innovation and clean energy as a threat um, to your energy um, goals or corporate energy goals? I, I can speak at a very high level to that, and I, I, I uh, apologize for not having more detail, but, but I know uh, for a certainty that as we are looking at our um, you know, all of our corporate operations, whether it's purchasing solar panels, um, other innovations, what have you, um, we are we are working through the supply chain and, and looking in and including that kind of issue with conflict minerals um, in our decision making and in our tracking. Um, I can't tell you any more than that, that it, it is on our radar screen. Um, but I think it certainly is, you know, all of those issues, and that's the complexity of all this, right? It, it It's not just, um, you know, the simple what's right in front of you. You really do have to track it all the way. So I, I, I don't have more on that, but it is definitely uh, an issue that we consider. And it's an issue for the, you know, that, that's very much on the radar of the technology organizations and technology companies. And, and we work very closely with our, our partners on this to make sure that we have the, the right systems and the right policies in place to, um, to, to track this. I can speak directly to the minerals issue, but I think you're touching on, <clears throat> I think, a broader issue uh, which is energy security, and I think it's on every government's mind around the world. And I think this gentleman, she was rightfully so pointing out in his comments about, you know, uh, you know, OPEC in the not early 1970s. Uh, we do a lot of work with the International Energy Agency out of Paris, and you know, I was struck the fact that they were chartered to address oil security originally, but they are working on topics just like you're talking about, um, particularly uh, natural gas. Uh, many of you talked about it as a bridge fuel, and they're working on the energy security issues because 
Uh, what we see, no matter what the topic is, whether it's minerals or whatever, is there are haves and there are have-nots globally as we look around the countries uh, that are part of the world. And that have versus have-not uh, creates the need for policy. One more question. I, I thought there was somebody in this group. There you go. I just got a, a group equality here. Um, hi, Colin Cunliffe with Department of Energy. Um, can you say any words about um, innovation in financing mechanisms? And I'm particularly interested in uh, the, DC, the District of Columbia's Green Financing Authority legislation, which would establish a green bank. I, I, I am aware of some of those issues. I'm, I'm really not, I, I don't have a lot of detail to add other than that. Um, I, I think, all right, let, let me say a few words. You know, to, to the theme of, of um, how we think about regulatory and policy structures, um, I think green banks and, and other kind of innovative vehicles like that, be it a yield or, or a company or, or those kind of things, the, the financial engineering, um, I think, is is really important and interesting in the sense that it provides a vehicle outside of the traditional sort of taxing or, or rate recovery authority of the government to, to enable customers, uh, be they large or small, to, to access financing and do things on their own. So um, I, 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 I can't get into the specifics of how any of those work, uh, but I think it's a great trend to see across the states as they're providing new uh, financing vehicles for these innovative technologies. And I, I think the Congressman mentioned this as well, and we shouldn't overlook it, that new technologies do, almost of a necessity, need a little help in the early on. And so you get through a green bank that's chartered to manage some of that new technology risk and, and to take it on, and you begin to show the, the regular banks, the mom and pop banks, the corporates, that oh, this does work, the revenues are there, you can finance on it. And so you begin to integrate it into the mainstream. So I think the green banks are a great innovation to help move that choice and innovation forward. And there's other innovation, other financial, really interesting innovation that's happening throughout the sector. I mean, we just signed at late last year uh, a new uh, contract for, for wind energy in Wyoming. And as part of that contract, we, we signed um, a new risk uh, contract uh, with um, Allianz for the um, for the the wind power because making sure it was actually between us and the power developers um, to to make sure that you know they they had a steady cash flow regardless of when the wind was blowing and so there's some really interesting and that can help facilitate additional capital going into those types of projects it can help um, obviously facilitate development of those projects and so there really is some some very innovative um, solutions that are happening throughout the, the sector just a couple of quick comments and I'll be brief about them. Uh, okay. A really good point. I can't comment on the Green Bank, but I think that what you're touching on, this idea of financial engineering, uh, when we started our journey, I talked about the wind example, uh, many others have, is this uh, the sector of, of developers, and I'll call it developers, has much more of a boutique feel than talking with a traditional uh, generator or base load generator in this, in this space, whether it's wind or solar. When we first started having the dialogue as a consumer, they wanted their money back in like three years or less. So they're like, look, we're going to build all these wind turbines, we're going to do all this, and we want our money back. And I said, <clears throat> okay, but that puts a burden on us to have to pay you double, triple the value for the electricity. And we invest in our chemical plants for, say, 35, 40 years. So does NRG and its plants and, and others, you know, to build a gas-fired or a nuclear plant. There's like a 30 or 40-year horizon of investment. So by shaping their, um, <clears throat> I would say, expectations and returns over a longer duration, which is getting into the financial duration, where I'm um, in the financial engineering, we're able to do some projects where otherwise they weren't able to. So we're having to redo our thinking in this area about how quickly you want to pay back to match out what's traditional in the business sector, industry, or you know the, the uh, public utility sector. Well, I, I, we're just a tad over our allotted time, and I know some people uh, try to schedule their lives around actual stated time frames. So I'm going to try to end uh, this, and, and I have the. Uh, the difficult task of trying to summarize what uh, everybody just said, but I'll try to do it in a quick, uh, quick way here. And first is, I think it's really clear, uh, and and it's been clear, and it should be clear if you haven't been noticing it that uh, that businesses are investing in clean energy, which is a, a very uh, a very important component to the long-term health of of the planet. 
um, that in the United States we have companies at the local level that are building projects that their products that are going to be worldwide uh, to uh, worldwide companies that already exist uh, to energy innovators that are all in this space of changing the way we think about products and, and energy. And, I, and the U.S. has been at the forefront of this. And I, I agree with the congressman earlier where he said we may be losing that in nuclear, which is very important because there are a lot of innovations happening there as well. Um, and then on the case that I asked at the end here is how can we make all this go faster? And uh, I think it'll keep going regardless. And I think it does transcend uh, corporate social responsibility. It's baked in to uh, the C-suite, as they say, and it's baked into the consumer's minds now that they expect uh, of this. So it's, we're, we're moving in a different direction here, but there's clarity that federal policy and even state policies in a coordinated way to avoid a patchwork completely uh, is a pretty important part. But it's different kinds of thinking on policy than maybe we thought of in the past. I alluded to this a little bit earlier in my earlier career. We said, how do we regulate this particular plant? You know, it's now how do we how do we financially adjust the markets to reward things for its for the attributes they have? I think you use the word attributes. You know, a nuclear power plant has attributes that are different than any other generator, than many other generators of power. You know, uh, the uh, um, the wind energy. You know, they have attributes, and how do the markets build that in? How do the markets build that in? And and I think that that is the one of the things that is pretty important here that market design as I think have been said several times and many different variations of it can stimulate capital in ways that that other things like green banks can help stimulate the beginnings but once you get the market straight the capital will be will be stimulated the other policy that I think is pretty traditional policy but is changed in some ways it was, used to be when I worked in Maryland we had the power plant siting commission think about that I even mean today. Mm -hmm. So um, what we need now is a, peop a permitting processes that can look at what's needed in innovative you know, uh, scenarios that we're in, whether it's distribution or or re re redesign grids, or even how do you uh, how do you permit an advanced nuclear power plant that's a passive plant that doesn't require pressurized water and everything else to operate, you know, so to avoid the problems that we've seen in the past. Um, so permitting and, and the data data. And, and the cloud and, and you know it's often called big data but the truth of the matter is it's, it's enabling instantaneous machine design decisions I'm not talk, call, gonna call it artificial intelligence otherwise Elon Musk will get upset but um, but I think that uh, machine driven decisions can go a lot faster with the proper information and, and some of the data that we can now see questions are how do you how do you, what, what are the how can we get government policy to help some of that happen faster? I appreciate the OPEC comment. We haven't talked much about liquid fuels here. Um, and liquid fuels, if you're thinking broadly, and the innovations happen. Yeah. But, but the, the issue here of how to electrify uh, some of the, some of the uh, things we do in society, whether it's our buildings or our vehicles, um, and then how we change the way we make electricity and think about it and how we mar use markets is pretty important. And lastly, I'll mention, it came up at the very end here, which I think is extremely important, the whole issue of how supply chains look. Um, every major company is looking at their supply chains and, and how to uh, look at what they call the circular economy. How can we keep these things cir circulating? You have uh, technology manufacturers looking at how to recycle the equipment. You know, everybody pull out your smartphone. There are lots of rare earth elements in there. Uh, how can we get all of that back once your phone is obsolete in the two and a half years that it is, and that would be stretching it? You know, how do you get all the materials in there back so they can be reused in the newer products you know, and minimize, you know, the supply chain, particularly on mining and, and, and other extraction? So, lots of good information here. We could talk about it for another day, but I really want to thank you guys for being on the panel. And Microsoft, thank you so much for uh, hosting us today in your Innovation and Pol Policy Center aptly named. Thank you. <laughs>